Hello and welcome to Apex Instant Tips, episode number 135, brought to you most Fridays at 12.05 Eastern Time, but today at 12.35 Eastern Time, because we have a meeting. Uh, we are your hosts, Anton and Marwa. Uh, thanks for joining today. If anybody even joined, I don't know, Marwa, we'll have to check to see if anyone. Yes. Here. Hi, Anton, and I'm always happy to be here with you. Excellent. Well, today we are going to... Um, we're actually, now that you've joined Marwa, I actually have a slide budget. So we're going to actually use slides today. We, we normally don't do that. We, we jump right in to other things, but but I I couldn't figure out a way to do this without some slides. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but we have a jam packed five minutes today. Um, I, I don't know that this has ever been done, Marwa, what we're going to do today. And I'm going to make a warning. We, we are trained professionals. Um, kids, don't try this at home. Um, this is, you know, this is something we're, we're not even sure we're going to be able to do it today. But please, you know, don't don't try this on your own. Five minutes to, to explain the architecture of Apex and Ords and how they work together. Um, what do you think, Mara? Are we are we going to be able yes. to do this? Yes, we will. All right. Well, I'm going to jump right in here and say most people understand that, you know, your your web browser talks to ORDS somehow and the ORDS talks to the database and the Apex engine and, and everything goes back and forth and and uh, comes around. Um, so uh, so but it's it's actually pretty complicated. We're going to kick off our timer I'm going to get that going. I'm going to kick off the timer right now and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on here. So first. Let me start with, it can be even more complicated. You can have firewalls and load balancing routers, multiple orders, multiple databases, but let's just talk about the simple scenario. Your browser makes a connection to ORDS and it's got something like this. This is your URL. So what's going on here, Marwa? Yes, so uh, it, let's forget, let's ignore the friendly URL. Let's take a look at this URL, uh, the blue word ORDS. It's the one that's going to connect to the database um, as the Apex public user based on the configuration files, the settings and pull XML file. That's why when you do a select user from the wall, you will get the Apex public user as a result. Now, the red one, the F question mark B, is a procedure that will be run uh, by ORDS as the Apex public user. Uh, that's it. That's 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 it. So. F is actually a function in the database. If we go look in the database, in the Apex schema, we'll actually see this function F. So you can run that function. It runs from the URL. Um, are there other procedures that we can run through the URL, Marwa? Yes, uh, we can run Apex, Apex admin. Right, so if I just go up to my URL up here and I just in the URL, now in, on apex.oracle.com, it's not ORDS, it's PLS Apex, but it's the same thing. If I type Apex underscore admin, it actually runs the procedure Apex underscore admin. And what that does, it takes me to the administrative services login page. But it does that by running that procedure. Um, and so can I run any single procedure from the URL? Can I just type any procedure up, up here at all? Actually, no, it depends because we have a, a, a function in the pool XML file that will tell us if that procedure is allowed to be run from the URL. That's it. This is incredibly important. This in your pool.xml security debt request validation function. That's the function you're talking about, Marwa. Exactly. You can change it to your own. You can get rid of it. You can do a lot of, th a lot of things, but this function checks to see, are you allowed to do it? And Apex has registered the procedures that it needs. If you need a, another procedure to be able to run right from the URL, you can register it as well, but you better be careful, okay? Yes. Because you want to make sure that these things are only run by the right people. Okay, so that's how the URL works. So, but, but I know that every time you build one of these connections, it's expensive. It takes a lot of work for the data, for, for the database to give a connection, tear down a connection. So what's going on here? What if another user makes a request and this connection is oh, either if, Yes, ahead. if another re user requests an Apex page, for example, and there is a connection that is available, it's going to be used for that user. But if there is not, then ORDS will create a new connection to database as long as 
it does not reach the maximum value allowed of connections. So it keeps reusing these connections on and on. What happens when it hits uh, when it hits that limit? When when it does, then the user will will be waiting for a connection to be free. So they sit and wait. Now those connections, that's in the settings.xml. There's a connection for the maximum number. So I sit and I wait. This is a scenario that I run into pretty frequently. Um, you've got an application that's been running well for months in in your production environment. You you make some updates. You produce you you install a new update to the application, and your connection pool starts getting overwhelmed. The first thing the developer does is says to to the DBA, "Can you change the settings.xml to boost the connections?" Right? But I think that's the wrong thing to do. If it's been running and you didn't get a big whole bunch of new users or something, one of two things is usually pretty happening. Either you have a slow page that's holding open a bunch of these connections, and so you want to troubleshoot that page, make the page faster so you're not wasting connections. Or the other thing that I think happens sometimes is you get a page that has, for example, all of your database objects or, or a whole bunch of rows in a classic report, and every row fires off a dynamic action. So then a single user is taking up 100 connections at once. You don't notice this in your dev, dev environment, but in production, you're going to notice it. Um, any way to protect against that? Well, we can, we can configure a setting in the administration instance, and it's in security settings, and it's called the uh, concurrent request for session. So right here, this is the one you're talking about. I encourage folks to take a look at the help on this and the, the subsequent one. It allows you to protect your database from users kicking off lots and lots of sessions, or I think that's our five minutes. I'm going to say, or from your developer doing something that's going to cause this as well, right? This will help you understand in your development environment before you move it to production that you've got a problem because this will start raising errors if you kick off all of these sessions for a single user. Um, yes. And that could result in timeout issues or denial request issues. That, yes. In fact, you're writing your own denial of service if you do this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that was five minutes. Um, and there's a lot to talk about here. We could go on for hours, a whole day, talking about the architecture of Apex and, um, and ORDS. Um, I have an additional tip that's related to this that's ORDS specific. But if you just came in for the Apex tip, you can beat it now, do all the things like um, tell your friends about it, subscribe, all of that. But if you want to hear, I've got to, I'm going to continue this tip into the ORDS realm. We've been talking ORDS Apex. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about ORDS and the Apex REST services. But let's see. I think I see. Um, uh, ah, Pradash is asking a question. If other clients like JDBC use the same database connection pool, do we have to do, consider that? Yes, Pradash, absolutely. Most modern technologies are going to have a connection pool, and it's the same kind of thing. You want to make sure that the connection, that, that your applications are only making use of a reasonable number of connections to the database. So absolutely, that's a, a, a definite, um, regardless of the technology, you want to do that. Um, I can say I... I know um, uh, with um, forms applications and so forth, you end up with some dedicated connections and that's one reason they don't scale as well. If you end up with you know, 50,000 connections to the database, your database really starts to struggle. Um, so that's one of the great things about ORDS and, and, and the, the way it handles connection pooling. But it's also important as developers that we understand that. Um, so, um, Hello to, uh, we actually have some live use, live viewers, Marwa, check that out. Yes. Lots of hellos. So, um, okay, so let's move on. I'm going to continue uh, the same, um, the same screen here. And, um, but the next thing is, let's say we're actually making use of ORDS, not ORDS to Apex. So an actual ORDS connection. The way that that typically looks is the URL changes after ORDS, you're going to get another word. In this case, it's Anton. That represents either the schema name or a mapping to the schema. Um, so what happens is we've got Anton squeezed in the URL. That tells ORDS to make a different kind of connection. 
it checks the setting in pool XML for a number of settings. It no longer runs as Apex public user. What kind of connection does it make here, Marwa? Do you know? It will, it will connect as the RDS public user, and then it will does a proxy connection. Exactly. It does a proxy connection to that Anton. What that means is if you select user from dual, what do you get? You get Anton. Uh-huh. So now it's not the Apex public user that's running this procedure. It's Anton that's running this procedure, right? And so this is another reason why it's just so important that you understand and you make use of that, um, that pool connection. Um, I'm going to show it again right here, this right here, because this is what determines what procedures can be run. So as we mentioned, normally in Apex, you have a page that looks like this. This is the ORDS connection. But what happens in here, up here, this does select user from dual. Apex public user, just as we said. What if I squeeze Anton in here? Well, if I squeeze Anton in there, right there, now select user is Anton. I'm running the same application. I'm on apex.oracle.com. I'm running the same application. If I didn't have this, if I didn't have this right here saying what procedures I could run, I could run any procedure owned by Anton through the URL. Exactly. Look at this. Marwa, you have a you have a, one out there too, right? Oh, yes. And I've got your schema here. But the, the thing is, Apex knows that I shouldn't be running as with the privilege privileges of, of Marwa. When I run the F function, the F function still runs the F application in the right workspace. So you can see this is still my workspace's content. This one, still my workspace's content. I don't have access when I run the F procedure to anything in yours because it's Apex is smart enough. It says, hey, F is owned by Apex. Apex says, do this. But if you had a procedure in here, say, delete employees, right? If you had this procedure, I would be able to run this as you except I can't because of this right here, okay? All right, so let's go one step farther and say, okay, most people don't do this. They don't do F question mark P equals up here. They don't put a procedure up here. What they actually do is a module, right? They do a module and a template because that's what you do with Oracle REST services. You create REST services. And in that case, it's going to invoke that REST service. So. If ORDS sees a URL like this, that's got a module and template that's registered for that, that user and everything, it's going to run that. So if I come back to uh, my screen here, I'll, I have something like this, and you can see here, it's that same URL, but now I've got a module and a template. And here in that module and template, it's telling me who am I, I'm Anton. This is a lot in five or 10 minutes, five minutes for each, let's say, of, of these. Um, but I think it's truly important for us as developers and, and, and users of Apex as, as builders to understand these concepts uh, because they're really, really important. Um, they, uh, they allow us, they, well, they, they, they teach us the right way to build our Apex applications, but they, it, it highlights some potential vulnerabilities that you want to make sure that you're you're keeping in mind. Um, you're right, Anton. It's so important for us to to get knowledge of all of this behavior. Uh, yeah, um, and I'll 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 tell you. I was um, let me see if two different workspaces linked to a same schema. How will the URL? Okay, so this is this is interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna dig into this in some depth. If I use this URL, I'm sorry, not, not this, let me go back here to my application. If I use the, the, the this is equivalent to ORDS, this is the, the access descriptor, and this is going to use Apex public user, and it will use the privileges of the application that are defined in the application. In the application, you tell it, what is my parsing schema? And so it's going to use the parsing schema. So in this case, I actually have two I have two workspaces on apex.oracle.com and I have two 
they actually can both work in each. So I could shift this to use the privileges of the Anton schema or the Anton two schema, because I have two on apex.oracle.com and they're both hooked to each other. This one is actually using Anton. So I, I can run Anton and, and do this. Um, this one uh, is doing the same thing, even though it's coming through a different user. Now it's Anton, it's still running that same application with the same privileges. And then if I do Anton two, or if I do Marwa, either one, I'm still going to only have access. Oops. Uh, maybe I've got something going on here wrong. Let me, I, oh, Anton two doesn't, that's not right. But if I do Marwa, let me go back to the, the Marwa here. Um, if I do Marwa, I'm getting the Marwa, I'm getting, I'm running it as the database user Marwa, but I still, this application is still parsing as the user Anton. So because I'm, but that's because I'm running Apex, because Apex is aware that this application, application 187642, that application is tied to the Anton schema. So when I run F question mark, P equals, or any of the Apex procedures, they understand that this application should run as Anton. But if I'm not running an Apex procedure, if I'm running some other procedure that I've that I've authorized, you know, my for example, my delete M, right? If I do this, that's not an Apex procedure. That's going to run with the privileges of M Shushin, or well, of whatever is mapped. M Shushin has is an alias for for this database user. Um, so I don't know Pradash. Uh, uh, or who asked that question? Let's see. I think it was Prash. I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but um, it's it's keyed into the workspace, um, to the the database schema that's tied to the application. Um, as it turns out, I'm just going to continue to ramble for a minute. As it turns out, you can you can have multiple schemas that are tied to your workspace, and you can actually at runtime change which schema an Apex application parses as. It's a little bit of a trick. Um, it's too much to get into right now, but there are a couple of APIs and things you can set to change the runtime of the application. Um, whew, okay, Marwa. Um, I think that covers it for today. I think I don't have any kind of uh, wisdom of the week or anything because we, well, we got a bonus tip. Our tip moved into ORDS. Exactly. Let's well. keep the wisdom of the week for the next session. All right. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. And uh, if you liked the video, like the video. Thank Do all you. The things. Be sure to tell your mom about the show. Talk to you soon. <laughs>